So I'd like to walk, yeah, welcome everyone to the world's the first Bach um, meetup, and uh, yeah, I'm very excited to do this. Uh, so I'm James Wilkie, your your main host today. I I'm a sound artist. I'm in education as well. I do Max MSP workshops, as some of you here do also. Um, I've just started working at Bartlett uh, College, uh, UCL, to uh, with their MA uh, design and interact, interactive design um, MA, and then I do my own work, commercial work, uh, and so on on the side of that. And so I'd like to perhaps allow the two uh, presenters that are here to introduce themselves. We've got Helen Berzo, Michele Zaccanini, and uh, Helen, would you mind um, sharing a bit about yourself, please? Sure, I'll do that. Um... I just want to say one thing, though, before I've, um, I, I assume you can all hear me, I hope. We've got that sorted. The one thing I don't have is audio going into Ableton now. I'm having trouble with that, but um, while I deal with that, I can still tell you a little bit about myself. Um, introducing me, I'm, um, I'm a, principally a flute player who got interested in working with uh, Max and Ableton a couple of years ago, um, mostly from wanting to do live electronic music and to get in a little bit into composition. And um, well, the reason I find myself here today is because about a year ago, I got interested in um, machine learning and um, neural networks and that kind of thing. And I, I got in touch with the Flucoma people out of Huddersfield. I um, learned about the uh, Flucoma tools and I got very interested in some of the work that the composer Hans Tuchke is doing. And if you know him, he's a pianist, composer, improviser who is professor at Harvard University. And he got into um, composing with Bach and the Flucoma tools. And I try to make a, um, like a version of my own doing this through Ableton, doing Ableton. And well, to back up a little bit, the reason this, I got interested in this kind of thing is because I'm, as a performer, I'm not really into gear so much because, you know, as I play, my hands are busy, my eyes are busy reading music a lot of the time, and I don't have, extra limbs to do extra midi knobs and work foot pedals and things like that because I'm busy doing other stuff. So that's why the idea of like machine learning and setting up neural networks really interested me. And it's also just sort of a gear saver, um, you know, to have everything inside my box and my laptop so I don't have to uh, carry lots of stuff around. It sort of just appeals to my um, sense of ergonomics, <laughs> I guess you could say. So that's what got me interested in this. And I came upon James's um, workshop where he um, introduced his MHS permutator that works with um, scrambling MIDI messages. And so my thing was to try to adapt that for live playing to where I could actually play something on any instrument, an acoustic instrument, immediately transfer that into MIDI and then use um, James's um, patch, which uses the Bach, to scramble that MIDI and play it back to me, either with a, a MIDI flute or some other kinds of sounds. That was the, the basic idea behind that. And that's why I'm here today, and I'm hoping that this is going to work, but I, at the moment, don't have any sound going into Ableton. So I'm not sure I'll be able to demonstrate this for you. <laughs> have you tried uh, the... Uh, inputs in Ableton, what, where are they selected, selecting right now in the audio preferences? They, um, external in, I've got external in, I can share that with you right now if you want. Um, um, do you have any other option? The options oh, because, are... Oh, because you were using the interface as your input. Exactly. And now I've got the... Oh. I didn't know that. Yeah. Right. So you that, could still do that. that in live. You could have a different driver on the in from the out. So right. we had a problem right. with Windows. ASIO and Zoom don't like each other on Windows. Right. You could probably still use ASIO as your input, Helen, but have the direct sound as your output. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Good. Live has two. All right. Let me try this. Let me try this. Hang on. Well, I, I'd have to plug. Let me. Then I will be plugging back my. Um, oh wait a minute. Let me try one other thing. It's going to move on to presenting other co-hosts while you have a try. Yes. Yeah. And um, so Jose uh, Vélez Aragon is also the third one who's um, appropriately got some stave notation in the background. Uh, would you like to go first, Michele? Sure. Uh, meaning go first in introducing myself or just the presentation? Go first, please. Thanks. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, my name is Miguel Zaclinini, and I am um, a composer, and recently, not that recently, actually, since a few years, I've been doing a lot of my work in um, doing audiovisuals, so translating the music that I produce into some visualization, taking care of um, the different parameters that I use for um for my music making into some visuals of sorts so i am i got into algorithmic composition uh, towards the end of my graduate studies um and i started using open music pretty much um yeah as a main uh, uh, generator for uh, for my material and then uh, i i start, I, I got the idea of why don't I use this to do also something that is not just sound, but something else. Since these are processes, then I can save all of the produced data to do uh, other things. And I like the idea of something that is aesthetically like static and kind of um, more of a, a, a sort of like an environment where you, where sounds and and images live and you kind of like uh take it in uh it's not very much a, a narrative sort of linear forward moving um musical idea but it's more of a hypnotic static uh texture and for that i think visuals can be effective in bringing in um a sort of like more immersiveness of experience and i'm still very much working on that it's it's a work in progress i haven't reach what I actually want to uh, achieve, but I feel like I'm getting slowly closer to what I want to do. And so um, today, I guess I will uh, kind of go through my uh, different steps that I use, um, which are still kind of evolving, but I, I do have a sort of um, uh, blueprint for what, what I, how I work through all of the different steps. And and Bach is, I said, like I used to use uh, open music, open music is a very um, interesting uh, program, but it has uh, some drawbacks. The main one being, it's not super user friendly and uh, it's developed by, I think, uh, just one person. Uh, and, and there is a user base, but it's not, uh, you know, it's very niche. It's, ni it's the niche of a niche of a niche. So it's... Uh, it's there are not so many people um, using it. Uh, so what the Bach is pretty much, uh, the way I see it is pretty much open music, but in uh, that lives in the Max environment. Uh, and Max has a much broader user base. And Max it was in uh, their need for, for something like that because it, Max is a programming environment, but it doesn't have certain, um, um, procedures where you can treat a list, uh, uh, complex lists and nested lists and all that, uh, which for algorithmic composer, it's kind of like your bread and butter. You have to be able to, to go through uh, complex um, structures of values and being able to process them in different ways. Um, so I think um, Andrea Agostini and um, what's... Uh, Daniele Ghisi are did a very good job at, um, at at reproducing open music in Max, and also they added new features. So they actually, in, I guess, some things that are missing in in Bach that were present in open music are the different libraries that different open music uh, 
uh, users have created. But other than that, there is there are all the tools that are available, plus there are new things that they, they have made with Cage and data and all that. So I don't know how long I should go with the with the introduction or should that, I just... That, that's perfect. Thank you, Michele. Yeah. So let's just uh, speak to Jose, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, then we'll start uh, doing the rounds of presenting. Perfect. Yeah. So hi, everyone. My name is uh, Jose Belis. I am a composer, uh, uh, interactive artist, uh, audiovisual person. You know, I, I do a lot of things, as I'm sure many of you guys do as well. Um, and I've been delving into technology for some time, uh, which all started with the idea of wanting to add more interactivity into live performances. Uh, and so at first, I, which I'll be showing you during my presentation, uh, I was doing live performances uh, with live musicians. Uh, uh, and audiences were able to interact with it using live voting software and being able to change the music that way. Uh, and, and through that, I wanted to add more interactivity to it. And so back was a, a perfect library to be able to get some uh, user input and uh, make those changes happen in real time. Uh, so I'll be showing you, uh, you know, somewhat of a demonstration of uh, how I achieved that and where I'm hoping to take the next in the future. Um, and, you know, aside from that, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in uh, artificial intelligence and, and bringing in into these live performances and, and being able to add some uh, generative uh, algorithmic uh, processes that can um, create music in real time so that, you know, when audiences interact with the software, they're generating music that the musicians play in real time. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so I think that's a very brief, you know, introduction. Uh, I think I'll, I'll delve dip deeper into it once, you know, I'm in the presentation. Thank you, Jose Feliz. Um, I guess one, one quick round with everyone who's actually here instead of it being about us and you. Um, if you say, if you'd like to show uh, very shortly what you're interested in with Bach, what's brought you to this meetup? I think that'd be really cool before we jump into the presentations to go up. I'll present and myself. I'm very curious about, as Mikado was saying, um, a niche of a niche of a niche, what everyone is into with this. <laughs> um, yeah, whoever wants to go first. Shall I go first? I'm just yeah. interested in seeing ways that we can extend the Max MSP toolkit. So that's for me the, the most interesting reward I could get from today. Thanks, Steve. Uh, my name's Ian and uh... <clears throat> I'm the author of Scheme for Max, which is another way of using Lisp in Max. Um, and it's fairly new. I just put out a new release. Uh, and so it, it works quite differently. It's a, a running S7 interpreter, which is the same thing that runs common music inside Max. And so one of the things I want to do in the long run is figure out how that can uh, cooperate with the Bach project. Perhaps um, there can be some, some synergies there. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, I can't stay the whole time today, but I'm just hoping to meet some Bach people and, and dip my toes into it. Thanks, Ian. And, and yeah, anyone who wants to throw uh, their, their, their perceptions on, in the chat, that's also just as good if you'd rather do that. Thank you, uh, Aban, Hassan, Brian, that's all great. That's great. So we've got we've got hyper specific interests and general curiosities. So hopefully you all and uh, I think the, the spectrum of the presentations are going to cover each of that. There's different layers to that. Helen's got more of a performance aspect, and then um, Michele has got more of a uh, performance and audiovisual outcome. And as I understand, Jose has uh, more of a, a I mean, brings out scores that are written uh, for performances as well. So there's a good spread there, I think. Um, well, without further ado, Helen, are you ready with the sound or would you rather have a bit more time and uh, get Michele going first? I, I think it's it's coming in. Okay. Uh, feel free to go first if you're, if you're ready. All right. <clears throat> so let me show my screen first just to make sure that this is um, actually coming in. Can you see? And uh, yeah. I. I also wanted to mention that um, my idea for this was to have something a little bit different from normal delay lines. I mean, because one of my interests in playing live electronic music is, um, you know, defined 
sort of different takes on just irregular granulation and looping, stuff like that. Um, and one of the things I love to do, um, which you can do, for example, in VCV rack or um, in uh, modular synthesis with Rainmaker, for example, is you can have delay lines where you get, you can have so many lines that what happens is when the sound comes back to you, it's only slightly related to what you originally played, which I think is really interesting. And, um, and you can do that as well in Ableton, but when I read about um, Hans Tuchka and his work, he's got a piece called Sparks for Piano. What he'd done is actually um, play something into a buffer and and have the delay, it, it actually resynthesizes, so you, it plays back what you do, but in a different order. Uh, so in other words, you're actually shuffling the notes that the notes are coming back to you in a shuffled way, which I thought was really amazingly cool. And there are two ways to do it. You can do it with audio using a buffer, like I said. Um, I've had less success with that, um, but I, I find the way of doing this with through MIDI and through the Bach um, uh, patches is a very clean way of doing this. So I'll show you, um, this is the patch, actually, I'll change this to the patch that I have here. If you're ready to have a look at that. Sound. So, James will probably recognize this as <laughs> a take on his patch. What I've, what I've had to do is um, redo the keyboard capture so that I have a um, an audio track in Ableton that has an audio to MIDI device at the end of it, which feeds the MIDI then, and the MIDI comes into this patch and into this Bach roll here. And I've set up, you can do that a number of ways. I could do this manually by just starting the transcribing, or I can do it through a metronome so that I have my, again, my hands free so I can be playing and it uh, transcribes the MIDI at set intervals. Um, I'm wondering how much detail to sort of go in this patch and how it works with the, um, uh, the, the scrambling. Um, probably just the best thing to do would be to um, try to Play something into it. Um, I can let me test and see if this will something will work at a, at a certain time. Yeah, that's a single note. It's does this it trembles. It. I don't hear anything. I don't hear anything coming out of Ableton. Um, we hear it. Did you hear anything coming out of? Yes. Oh. Okay. Okay. Um, if our voice in. Let me try this a bit with random more randomly. No, let's see. I don't I don't hear what's coming out. You should hear um you should hear this um what's coming out here. And it's oh not. no, maybe not. Maybe we don't hear that. No, sorry. I'm sorry you're not hearing it. So so anyway, um yeah, this is something to uh that I need to address. Um, but this is to show you the idea behind that. And perhaps for the moment, I could either spend some time trying to fix this and demonstrate it farther and somebody else could take over and I could continue this later. Is that a, um, is that an idea? Probably just keep things moving. Sort of yeah. Like, thank you, Helen. That's 
We've also we've always got the breakout rooms later, guys. If you want to go into super deep technical patchy stuff. <laughs> Thanks, V. Uh, Michele, would you like to jump in? Sure. Um, yeah. So, I guess my presentation is more. Uh, I'm not a performer, uh, alas. Uh, I'm more of a like. I just clo like lock myself in a room and and work on on um, uh, offline, I guess. Um, and for for things that are not in real time, Bach. I mean, you can do real time Bach uh, stuff with Bach, but um, if you want to do complex processes and uh, uh, bigger patches, of course, uh, the idea of of doing um, uh, real time performance is more limited and. Um, so my general process is to uh, define an algorithm uh, that I think will produce a certain um, aesthetic um, idea. Um, and my focus is usually on having some sort of, um, well, first of all, my algorithms are usually deterministic. So I, whenever, it, which means that whenever I put a certain um, set of parameters, I will get the same results over and over. Uh, so uh, it's there is no random object uh, usually in my in my patches. It's always like um, I mean in my compositional patches. Of course, I do other stuff too. But for my composition, uh, if I open the patch uh, later and I have the same set of parameters, I will get the same exact result. Uh, and so I, but having said that, I do use um, algorithms and objects that produce a sort of like. Um, fractal-like um, outputs, meaning things that uh, produce a certain degree of chaos, but it's uh, it's a sort of chaos that I want to be able to control and to be able to uh, control the degree of uh, uh, entropy, I guess, in, in, the, in the musical system and being able to tweak it uh, at, at will. So I use uh, certain processes such as um, I will show one, um, and let me share screen. Um, I'll share this. So you can see this, right? The patch? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the first, the object that I've been using more and more, can you see it now? Like, yes, is that the same. Okay. Because I just enlarged it on my screen. Um, so pretty much what this uh, object does is to uh, have an event uh, move um, in, in a certain space, uh, move um, in a bounded space. So I have here a space that is 16 uh, steps long and it has a certain speed and a certain length. And the event in this case is just a note will move forward until it hits the the edge and, and of course it hits the edge with the rightmost uh, bound meaning if it's longer it will hit the edge earlier and then it will start going back so something like this so now it's moving towards the edge and then it's bouncing back and if i increase the speed of this uh it will go it will bounce um uh, it will it will move back and forth more rapidly. I can Michelle, change. Can, the... can we ask you to just zoom in a little bit on your patch? It's a little bit small. Oh, okay. Oh. So, uh, yeah. So I think I need yeah, to half the screen is empty max canvas for some reason. That's okay. better. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Because I have a huge screen, and uh, sometimes I don't know what you can see. Uh, so. So this is what uh, what what the general algorithm is. So it's not it's not really complicated, but as you can see, as I change these parameters, I will get many different results. And of course, this is moving in uh, in like uh, I have an iteration number. So this is the two hundred and fifty something uh, iteration of this bouncing motion. And of course, uh, the one of the thing that makes this uh, um, appealing to me is that it has a bounded a set of outputs. Um, so a bounded output, meaning that you will only output values within a certain bounds. And I can use this to determine the rhythm 
uh, of, of something. And of course, instead of doing it like I'm doing it now here, uh, I can just accumulate the different iterations and get a rhythm out of that. So uh, in this case, I'm just using the same exact pattern and I'm just using like, I'm iterating through all of the values of the rhythmic values that I'm getting out of that. Uh, and, um, and then I'm collecting it and creating just a set of onsets for, um, for, the, for the final score. So this is pretty much uh, what I'm using. And of course, in this case, I'm just simplifying things by having 16 notes as my basic value and a 4-4 four -four measure. Of course, all sorts of rhythms can be created. I use this not just for rhythm, I also use this for velocities and for pitch. So if I go into a more, um, if, you, if I go into a more complex patch, um, uh, let me see uh, here. So this is a more complex version of what I showed you uh, where I have uh, multiple voices and I'm using, as you can see here, I'm the, I have uh, a certain uh, set of parameters for each voice and, the, uh, and I have parameters to control, not just the onsets, but also uh, the, um, also the um, uh, velocities and pitch. And I have a collection of pitch from which I choose um, like, uh, can you see this? No. Thing? No. Okay. Let me share the screen. Actually, let's let's share the screen uh, completely uh, instead of doing that. So uh, this is the chord visualization, like where I'm choosing the pitches from, um, and so on and so forth. One thing that I was talking about uh, uh, with James yesterday, maybe I should mention that I, um, my life was made much easier by using this object shell, uh, which is not, it's not a default, of, it's not in the max uh, default set of objects. You, you have to download it, but it's cool because pretty much you can interact with your uh, uh, terminal uh, and uh, have some output uh, from, uh, from the terminal if you so wish. So my, um, uh, my, big problem that I had for a long time with Max and in certain degrees, I'm still um, trying to, uh, um, to, to uh, manage that is my uh, opening a patch and having many different parameters uh, and being able to retrieve them uh, in a consistent manner. And my favorite program for that would be uh, Excel, just because it's, it keeps everything clean and, and it's, uh, you can also do, uh, functions on different columns and, and you know, it works, you know, so it's something that I always wanted to use in max, but it was not very much easy to do. You can set your, um, your, uh, your preferences to, to have like your text editor to be Excel. So I thought I was, I was like, oh, that's great. Uh, external text editor, you can choose Excel, uh, and that it will open it whenever you click on the text um, object, it will it will open in Excel. But then unfortunately, what happens is that if you change, if you have it open in Excel, then text will not read it in real time. So you cannot make changes. So I, I just started using Shell, which is pretty much, uh, you just open a terminal window um, and um, you can just print things in, and print things in, in your terminal. And, um, and then, so if I do, uh, for instance, this is just, uh, can you see this? Can you see this zooming in? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. yeah. Uh, so I just uh, target where my files are and I type the, the type command, which is prints uh, in the in the terminal, prints out the content of the CSV file, and it will come out uh, in the terminal like that. So instead of doing that in the terminal to have this output in uh, in Max, you can use shell where you send a command um, where you can get the output. 
and then you do a little bit of a symbol uh, mumbo jumbo and then you get the you get the output and you can parse all of these parameters which in my case are um like i mentioned uh these are the um the my uh bouncing uh pattern parameters and i can add how many iterations the pitch collection and then the parameters for the velocity for pitch and all that so you can get pretty uh complicated but this is a way to keep things organized that i like instead of using say call or or even text which can be so I think one of my favorite features of Max is that it is expandable. Um, so you can add different components. And I hope this they continue to develop this object shell um, because it's it really opens a lot of possibilities. You're gonna have like Python scripts uh, in in your in your uh, thing. And I don't know. I was I'm curious to check out Ian's project um, and see if there's something uh like that that uh we can use uh Actually, for if I can, if I can yeah speak to that, sure Michelle, because uh, I was just about to type that I would get in touch with you I literally last night released a new version that that includes a grid UI object um and an internal array structure so that you could you could do something like that uh very easily you could, oh. uh, all the all the elements in uh in scheme vectors and and have them update a grid on the screen and serialize that to to save it to text so um i'll i'll follow up and get in touch with you because that would be a interesting use case for me to make a a, a demo of um, and see if that would be helpful for you yeah that that sounds yeah i feel like i feel like having something like that it would just improve for for us algorithmic composers that will just uh, improve our lives much more um because all of this can be very cumbersome uh otherwise um yeah i mean that's exactly why i made it was like i i need to just be able to see a grid of numbers that updates really fast and yes way less hit on the cpu than using jit cell block which which bogs down really quickly so yeah the, the s4m grid it updates from c uh you can you make a typed array and i can run a whole bunch of them in real time you know while I, ableton's playing so i will Definitely get in touch with you. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Get more of it. Yeah, no, no, it's, uh, no, it's. I'm glad to. I'm glad you're you're doing this. Uh, it's much needed work. Um. So what else? So yeah. So whenever. So this is my intermediate step where I uh, pretty much have um, my output from that big Excel file. Uh, in this case, it's five voices, and I just kind of check it out and see whether I get some result that is interesting or their components are interesting. Again, uh, uh, take them apart, and I actually jump right into a DAW in this case. Like I open either uh, Reaper or uh, or Ableton. I usually use Ableton for for sounds, but Reaper is kind of better at MIDI. So um, when I have to do recording of uh of things in midi which is my pretty much the the thing that i use i use the most in terms of saving uh things and uh, and edit uh the composition then um we can um you can really save things and you can see here how you see the bouncing um idea translated into a cv and cc data so i'm actually saving the idea of the bouncing motion uh in uh in cc and um and so that why do i say that well you can use it in many different ways but um i use it uh mostly for visualization because i want to keep this idea of the bouncing motion is uh translates well i think into into a visualization because i'm actually exposing uh part of the algorithm to the visuals so I'm actually having um, a um, component of the of the process being revealed in the visualization, which is was one of the initial ideas. Um, and so I don't know how much time I have left. If I can go deeper into this, uh, how much time did I go through? I didn't measure myself. I mean, about fifteen minutes so far. Oh. So 
Okay, so I, I have a little more time. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so yeah, I use this. I save all of this uh, different uh, data into MIDI, and then I I can start kind of parsing through what I think is successful or not. And in this part of the process, the compositional process, so far it seems it's probably seem like a very mechanical and uh, and um, and and sort of like. Um, rational approach to composition which in a way it is um because i'm trying to achieve things um you know kind of like cate categorizing the different steps and taking and and rationalizing formalizing everything but at this point when i get to the generation of data and uh, i'm parsing through the different uh, material that i get this is when i become more kind of like just using my instinct and uh, using my right brain, uh, meaning that, that just I just kind of grab things that I think are good and I can work with, um, rather than measuring any any parameters. So I produce for me, and I think for a lot of uh, people using algorithmic processes, uh, the algorithmic composition aspect is uh, just a generator of ideas that um, of. Of material that from which you get inspired and from which you start um uh you start generating your final sort of uh work and this is like you know goes back to cage and the idea of the composer as the listener uh is is something that i i find that is one of the biggest contribution of cage to musical thinking uh so uh from that you you can start editing you can start um i can start you know using different components and um and then coming up with the with the structure of the piece uh which is uh more and more as far as i'm concerned um trying to uh, exploit this uh, like some rhythmic features that are kind of subtle um I start from more complex uh, rhythmic structure and then try to extrapolate different components um, to generate generally um, veering towards more and more kind of minimalistic uh, aesthetic where uh, you appreciate like the different um, nuances of different rhythms and the idea of using um, velocities i.e. accents as an important feature of the way we perceive rhythm. Um, and so um, I can show a couple of examples of what I do, uh, I think, at this point. So I have a YouTube channel uh, where I post a bunch of things. Uh, let me see. Can you see this? Oh, yeah. uh, I'm not sharing anyone. Um, so in my on my YouTube channel, I kind of post a bunch of, of different things. There, it's not super um, consistent. Meaning, I post uh, back um, back videos, and the back videos are uh, I got at some point. I was posting back videos a few years ago, and some people told me, you know, this is not very clear. Can you start from uh, from a more kind of basic uh, uh, point? And I so I started doing now recently um, videos where I try to be as clear as possible, which sometimes is not super easy uh, for me. Um, you, I've been doing this kind of work for a while, and sometimes I just assume that the knowledge is already there. Well, you know, I should be careful because Bach is. Um, a different way of approaching maths altogether. Um, and so I post those and then I post like general topic videos, which I get a lot of flack for, for, but it's, you know, I kind of vent my opinion there or rant <laughs> or something like that. Uh, but um, also I post my audiovisuals uh, that uh, I, these are the product of my later kind of production um and so i can show something like that uh now so the first example i want to show is a um something that shows how the bouncing motion 
of the of the rhythms that I generate in uh, in in um, uh, with my algo bouncing algorithm are reflected in the motion of the visual object that I created. So you will see how uh, in the first example the 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 tentacles of this creature, whatever it is, is um, they're actually the bouncing motion of the algorithm, and they have different speeds, so they don't align, but they are consistent with the rhythm that you hear, uh, and so it's it's kind of like subconscious, and maybe it's not a big, you know, I think that you really notice, but you can see how the motion will be consistent sort of with the, the output. So let me. Um, oh, and now I don't hear it. Okay. Uh, let me share it. Okay. Can you see this? Yes. So the piece goes on uh, and it gets more complicated. So that's one example. Um, I just play quickly another one. Um, oh, oh shit. Uh, sorry. All right. Share screen. my attempt at sort of like minimal techno um, idea. Uh, so I'm trying to do something that is, of course, for a, a broader public and uh, and that really connects the, the music to the visual in a direct way that it's kind of traceable and you can kind of um, relate to. Uh, and it's, I think it's something that it's, it's exciting in this moment. There is, uh, this one thing that excites me is the idea of really creating something that is in between music and visual. And I'm now exploring, so this is all you, you have seen so far is done with shaders uh, in, in kind of like programming all the visuals, it takes a long time. I started using Unity recently, um, but it's it's always like a struggle to find good ways to to visualize music. And one thing that makes uh, everything possible is having everything saved and uh, edited in MIDI, because that's the only way really to visualize. Helen was talking about 
uh, using MIDI instead of audio. MIDI is really the only way to do this kind of work, to do real, uh, like real um, uh, precise work on notes and on velocities, on animation. It's the only way we have really. Unfortunately, 40, 40, 14 beat um, uh, MIDI is not really as good as I thought it was. Like it's very buggy in many applications. So we are still stuck with the seven bit um, for data in MIDI. And that's one thing that I wish, uh, I hope it's gonna get better. Um, yeah, I think uh, I'm out of time, but. Yeah, that's a great moment to uh, transition. So should we go uh, to Jose first before you, Helen, before cycling back? Th that's that's fine with me. Yeah. I think I think I've got things right, but let's let Jose okay. have a time. Thank you. OK, Jose, over to you. Perfect. Uh, so let me share my screen. Um, And there's other way. Oh. Can use this. Okay. Uh, so again, as I was mentioning in the beginning, uh, a specific one I'm going to talk is about how to use back uh, for interactive live performances. Um, and uh, you know, I'll be talking a bit about sort of how I got started with this, and then I'll go through one of the projects I've worked using this. Uh, I've worked on a couple other directions as well, but I figured this uh, implements sort of the trajectory of uh, utilizing sort of a, a branching mechanism for interactivity. Um, and then, you know, I'll talk more about sort of my observations in this process, some of the limitations that I've found, and uh, what are my hopes to go next within this. Um, so as I was mentioning, uh, you know, I started doing interactive live performances uh, where audiences were able to vote live and change the music in real time. Uh, this was a direct influence of, you know, the vertical approach in video game music uh, and, and sort of that branching narrative path um, where, you know, you can go to A or B and then that breaks into a different path, et cetera. Uh, and all of this is a section-based approach. So you have a section that has a specific um, musical characteristic and you can pick between one or the other and then so forth. Uh, so just to show you an example. Yes. So that's essentially the idea. Uh, and there are some uh, limitations to that. Uh, as you may have seen the video, I was uh, essentially the way I wrote the score. Uh, I just have the multiple paths written really to the music for the musicians. And I was using hand signs depending on what the audience voted. Uh, and that was the approach. So I wanted to find a way to uh, you know, add more interactivity. Uh, it led to a couple of projects. One of them uh, is called Music United, uh, in which I wanted for the interactivity to allow audiences to not just control the overall path of the entire ensemble, but go more into depth into controlling individual sections, individual uh, you know, uh, performers, and, and being able to create a combination that's unique to that specific moment, depending on how they decide to control each of the different sections of the music or the 
uh, ensemble. Um, and so Music United had both uh, an in-person aspect and a remote interactivity, uh, again, with using the same concepts, uh, but this time within smaller sections at the same time. So I'll show you a quick example of the online version so you can see it, uh, and then I'll, I'll show the back version. We continue. Oh, there we go. So that's the idea, and uh, you know, in this in the online version, I was able to use a lot of ensembles uh, or four ensembles. Um, I wanted to create sort of that blend of uh, you know the different sort of worlds within uh, you know music and different genres, uh, and create those very unique blends. Uh, and then for live performance, which is was the one that I used back for, uh, I only used one of the ensembles, the classical ensemble. And it was uh, slightly different. So instead of controlling on an ensemble by ensemble basis, audiences were able to, in sort of this relaxed environment, uh, be able to walk up to each musician who had uh, an interface in front of them and control those individual musicians in real time. So then the music kind of always was different depending on how people uh, you know, interact with each individual musician and create a combination. So here's an example of it. And for some reason, you can't hear it. Can you guys hear it? Afraid not. No, we can't hear it, Jose. Uh, yeah, me neither. Uh, <laughs> weird. Uh, not to worry, it looks great though. What a fantastic project. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, but you can see how it works. I mean, I'll, I'll hopefully in the next part of the show has some sound, but you know, people were interacting with them in real time and, and you know, each musician had, you know, their own uh, interface in front of them. So people were, you know, changing in, in, in real time. Um, and again, this was all sort of this section-based approach. Um, and now just to show you a bit more of the process for it. Um, the way to make this work within back, I, I had the score that had the multiple paths going on. Uh, this is kind of what it looks like. So, you know, we start with our starting point and then from there it broke into, you know, each individual potential path and, you know, you could have all kinds of combinations. Uh, in this specific performance, I kept uh, some of the back process very simple. So I had some, um, a, a transposition uh, buttons. So people were able to transpose between different areas in real time as well. Um, you know, so you could have faster at a higher register, et cetera. Um, and of course, there's potential to use any other algorithms to, uh, you know, add other types of filters. So maybe you can, you know, do any kind of key filters or, or rhythmic filters, whatever it may be within back uh, in this real time scenario. Um, and then something I had to do as well, uh, I had to uh, 
cut the music into segments uh, just because something I found when I had the entire score and write some of those processes, it, it would affect the, the performance in real time. And uh, there was delays in, inside the uh, scores that the musicians were reading. So I had, for instance, section one uh, cut into the, the piece and then it was, it read section two, et cetera, et cetera. That way the processing was kept to a minimal. Um, so hopefully we hear sound now. Uh, I pre-recorded uh, sort of a demonstration of this because um, I was using uh, multiple computers for it. So it's kind of easier for me to kind of record a demo uh, to showcase it. Uh, but I had a master computer running a, a click track and it was sending everything through the network uh, using the UDP send. Um, and essentially it's just, again, keeping every single computer in, in, in the same uh, location as musicians are reading the score. And each network computer received that data and um, it was running the back of score. Uh, and this network of computers had um, tablets networked to them uh, using the mirror package and that UI communicated to back directly. Uh, so people could, um, you know, change the musicians or musician score in real time. Uh, so let me show you the inside of how that looks. Hopefully you can hear it. Now I'll talk through it. Um, let me try stop sharing and sharing again. Maybe that helps. Let's see. Uh, there we go. On the top. Okay. This is a demonstration of what the setup looks like uh, within Max. Um, on the top right corner, you see the main computer. Um, which is running a click track. Um, and then everything else is in another computer, uh, which is running the back.score uh, and a user interface, uh, all from within that device. Let me demonstrate. So when you press play on the main computer, that uh, starts off the back.score playback, as you can see, you can follow along. And at the same time, it starts the interface uh, that people interact with. Uh, in this case, you know, they can make an option, pick a beautiful melody, and then when the timer is running out, it starts loading that uh, on the interface. And on the left side, you see that it opened up a second save so the musicians can see what's coming up. And then immediately when we get to the section of the beautiful melody, it changes into that specific stave. Um, now there's also the control for audio, as you can see, as you change on the interface, uh, the musician sees different dynamics or it says don't play. And now time around, loading agitated, we have two staves and now as we go right to the section, we get just agitated. Um, Again, this works really well on this approach that I'm using uh, where it's on a section by section basis. Let's take a closer look. This is the main computer um, that is running the click track. Uh, I kept it pretty simple just to avoid any delays in terms of uh, synchronization between the multiple devices. Uh, as you can see here, we have a set of IP addresses to send messages to all the different network computers. Uh, and then over here, we have a section uh, where I have all of the measures where changes take place. Uh, so I just use the call object and a route mechanism to make that happen. And within here, you can see that it's all being sent uh, using this mechanism over here. Uh, which, which is created for an easy way for me to update the measure numbers. Now let's take a look at the click track. In here I'm using a MIDI track to trigger the click and it's sending audio from within this computer uh, that's been sent to the musicians and then it's also sending measure numbers to the receiver computers. Uh, it's sending both the measure numbers for the entire piece and also sending measure numbers for each section. You'll see why the measure numbers for each section are necessary once we look into the receiver computers. Now this is the receiver computer 
uh, what each of the musicians has. They have a bunch of parameters uh, to be able to tweak it, um, changing the heights of things, changing the spacing, whatever they need to be able to properly read it. Now let's look inside. So in here, I used a three-step process to be able to make this work. In the top, we have a back.row, uh, which is the one that's reading everything. As you see here, uh, we send a variety of XML files for them to be read. These were split into sections that coincide where the experience changes in different paths. This was done to alleviate some of the processing power needed to change and dump uh, information from one backdoor score into another. And it made it so that the musicians didn't have any gaps uh, or any delays within their scores. Now moving on, the information from that first backdoor score is dumped into another uh, backdoor score at specific times. And I used a transposition if the audience picked a transposition. So within a transposition, it grabs the required transposition chosen by the audience, and then it dumps that uh, into the back news back dot score with the new transposition. Uh, I used just some um, node-based transposition uh, rather than using sense. Uh, because they allow the score to look cleaner. And on top of that, I use some key filters uh, using some calls uh, to send it to the backdoor score. So I use the right and harmonics whenever I change um, to a different key. I had to do this because I was working in a tonal harmonic language, but people that are using something as a tonal or the key doesn't really matter or harmonics are not really gonna affect the reading then this key filter is not necessary, but it's something you can use in back to communicate and change that in real time. And then that transpose score with the right harmonics gets dumped into our final back dot score, which is one that musicians are reading. And this one uses the cache.remap voices object, which allows for remapping of specific uh, voices from within the score. So if the audience chooses to switch voices, uh, we then use the hide uh, voices message to open up uh, two uh, voices that are assigned by the cache.remap. And then as in the demonstration, we then close it um, to show only the voice the musician should be reading whenever we have that change. Now going back to the top, we have here a receive of the changes. So whenever there is a section change, we do that here and that triggers different changes within the backdoor scores. And then here we have our measures. Um, so let me show you how that works. So I'm activated on the main computer. So when I press play, we have the measures changing. And this is being sent all the way down to what the musician is seeing. And I'm actually using the set cursor message uh, to be able to move the playback. I use this method rather than using the internal backdoor score playback because it allows for syncing of all the backdoor scores between the different computers. And so this is the way I achieve it. Also, this is the reason why in the master computer I was sending individual um, section measures because whenever a new section is loaded in this mechanism has to start from the beginning of that section so every time we change sections there's a reset to start from measure one so that the playback looks the appropriate way now over here i have the abstraction that's interacting with the cage.remap voices and i have two sections on the left we have the strings which requires slightly different algorithm and then the piano and the algorithm is different because you know piano has two staves now let me show you how this works so as we start it and we select for instance beautiful melody we get a number change there and then beautiful melody change to two 
from there that triggers that change which sends a message of one two to cache dot remap that way voice two appears below voice one and then from there we again use that mechanism I showed earlier of the hide voices um, so you see how that works so for instance, if we were in voice one and the person activates voice two, we have when they open up voice one and two, and then when we get to the right point where we need to change, voice one you know, uh, moves to the bottom, mo voice two moves to the top, and then we hide it like that. Um, you know, it's just about exploring the cache remap voicing and triggering that at specific times and hiding voices if necessary. Now let me show you the interface that the audience used, which is right here. And I actually used the mirror.frame object and that was connected to a bunch of iPads. And I created everything within Max. But the interface could have been done and connected with JavaScript. It's just, you know, that's what I was able to do for now. And that's essentially it. So, you know, that's a closer look at how it worked in this specific project. Uh, you know, if you're interested, you know, to learn more about it, you know, here are some links and I can share them later as we break into groups. Uh, and on the second link, you, you can access, oh, what do I do? <laughs> that's great. Thank you, Jose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, am, I, am I out of time or? Uh, no, I think if you want, how, do you want another five minutes? Uh, sure. Well, I just wanted to talk about some of the observations, you know, through this process and sort of where it could be taken next and, uh, you know. Yeah. Uh, so essentially, you know, this was sort of a, a prototype and, uh, you know, allowing to do that section by section changes between, uh, um, you know, whatever the audience chose. Um, and you know it's well received by the audience, and especially people seem to like more uh, immediate uh, changes. So, for instance, they really like the uh, you know being able to change the dynamics in real time, hearing the musicians do that. Uh, you know, and uh, that's something that you know I want to explore more in the future, which I'll get to quickly. But um, there are some limitations, of course, you know, there's, there's still some, uh, you know, processing issues when you're utilizing back the score and doing this. And of course, you can segment things to make this uh, more feasible, uh, you know, but it still required uh, a lot of devices as well. So, you know, there's like some kind of integrated system where one computer is running everything. So, you know, when you're networking a bunch of computers together, there's always issues that come about. Um, and you know, as of now with this process, there is a lack of, you know, sort of this fluid approach to interactivity because it happens sort of in a section by section uh, um, moment, uh, you know, so right now I'm trying to explore how to be able to activate this in a more uh, direct way, uh, you know, and it requires a lot of extensive preparation, as you saw, you know, you need to split the sections, et cetera, et cetera, um, you know, which brings me to sort of, what I'm working on to do next. So, you know, I wanna try to find the right methodology to do this in a more streamlined process, maybe requiring less devices, uh, you know, one strong computer running a lot of the scores at the same time, um, and also implementing more complex generative systems uh, so that as people are interacting with it, uh, there's actually some more complex uh, generative uh, algorithms going within the backdoor score rather than just uh, preset section with some transposition um you know and and then of course as i mentioned having more immediate interactivity other than the section by section and uh also implement some methods that don't require the metronome uh you know because i guess some some types of music uh would benefit from that uh, uh but yeah and you know when we're going to break so i would love to you know have some of your input uh regarding this and you know any ideas you guys might have uh based on what i've done and I would love to hear how you guys would use this approach, you know, within your own compositions and, and so forth. Uh, so, so, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jose. And, uh, okay, Helen, over to you. <laughs> yeah, really cool, Jose. Um, okay, I'm hoping this is going to work. I just, um, I left off 
wanting to be able to just show you how this is going to work and, to sound. Work and sound. So, 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 so. Are you able to hear Are this? Are you able to hear this? We do, we hear a delay, but that's too bad. Yes, so you hear the, um, whoa, here they go again. <laughs> um, great. All right, All right. So stop the drums, great. So stop the drums, great. All right, so that's All right. the idea so of providing idea melodic, of uh, providing melodic uh, variation for this. Variation um, for this. It's um, just very simple. I've got just very simple. I've got my own harp going through my own some harp going through harp some sounds. DBC harp and sounds. What I've got and to I've further um, ornament the melody. The melody. As if you can see this, here's the. You can see this. Here I've got the BBC the, harp going. Here I've got the BBC harp I've got going. A few, I've got a um, few. What do you call it? Um, Grace notes going from JSM Spike, from JSM which is a really Spike, cool Max for live device, really cool that, adds, for live device um, that adds MIDI ornamentations. Um, MIDI ornamentations. Um, this is just um, this. The major is to quantize. The major is to quantize. The, it's into C major, the, but that can, major, can do with or without that. that. Some random velocities. Some random velocities. That's um, that's um, that's how that's gone. That's how that's out. gone. I've and out. I've got another got besides another, the permutator. Besides the permutator. Like this. Like this. I'll stop sharing. I'll show something else. A little bit more. This is with the cage. It has more to do with rhythm, and direct. Direct. Um, what do you call them? Uh, delays. So, okay, I'll keep the harps and I'll keep this coming in from. So if I run this, what this cage agogic does is it will take my signal and, oh, I need to, yes. <laughs> I need to share this. Sorry, uh -huh. sorry, you're not seeing, but I'm seeing. Here we go, sharing this out. All right, all right. So I think you've got it I now. I think you've got it now. Here's the cage. Here's the cage. A gogic. A gogic patch. So this, so this um, abstraction, um, abstraction of course, can, can be, be uh, you can uh, set these can parameters. Set these parameters. Um, right now there's um, nothing right going there's on, nothing but, I've on. but I've got it for, set, for set for three repetitions. Three repetitions. And this is the, uh, this is the uh, end, uh, end acceleration. acceleration that should that happen. Should happen. Let's, Let's just see if I can get this going. Get this going uh, let me just make let sure, just I've, got make sure I've got the audio to MIDI audio to coming, coming in this. this. Let's check this for just, a, this moment. For just a moment. Voice ends. All right. All right. So let's see. So let's see. Okay, it's working, but okay. then the sound's working, not coming in because I probably set something out. I probably set something completely wrong. Completely wrong. The metro is off. The Q metro is off. Yes. Yes, but you should be hearing yes. this. But you should when be it plays. hearing this. When it plays. No. No. All right. So I'm going to turn it off. Right. Ah. So I'm going to turn it Sorry. off. Ah. And this, this and you this, should be able to hear this. this you should be able to hear not, this. Um, but it's not. I'm not sure, um, but that's probably my. I'm not sure, that's but probably that's probably my. my problem. That's probably problem. my. Problem. Anyway, problem. but anyway, you get the sort of idea that once you've got any of these Cage or Bach uh, scrambling or expanding or you know, contracting sort of things that can be worked into MIDI through Ableton, you can send it into any any kinds of sounds that you want. 
that's um, the basic idea. So I think rather than wasting your time on what's going wrong with my particular patch, I'll just um, see if there are any questions there. There are... Yeah, I'll... Okay, thanks, Helen. Um, sure. Yeah, well, I guess we can start going to breakout rooms, really. It's probably the best thing. Uh, I get, uh, we can go by theme rather than uh, person, maybe. Uh, or are we interested in jumping into specifics? I guess we actually know. Yeah, I think we should go by speaker, a room per speaker. Should we do that? So we've got, uh, yeah, because I mean, I think the topics are, are already focused enough that way. So I, I mean, I really like that idea as composer, as listener. Uh, I really like this idea of MIDI and passing data and live and sort of live interactions with Jose. And microtonal is something that we didn't approach. It's unfortunate that Emmett had to leave because he's fascinated with microtonal work and Bach offers this. And that's an aspect that we haven't covered. Um, and that would be another room, but I think there's there's not quite enough of us to make so many different rooms. So uh, I'm going to try and remember how to make these breakouts. I'm doing it for you, James. Oh, so oh if, yeah. You. I mean, maybe you want to press stop on the recording, but before yeah. we do that, maybe if you don't mind me just sharing one other thing for everybody who's here and for prosperity in the recording, um, we actually have coming up very soon our next sponsored cycling event with Ted Moore from the Flu Coma Project. So he's going to do an overview of creative possibilities with flu coma. This is coming up in November. It's completely free. So I feel I know quite a few people in this call are probably quite interested in flu coma. I know Helen's mentioned it, but one of our devs, Ted, from the project from Huddersfield, will be doing a free workshop at Hackspace in November. So that might be something that interests some of you. Um, back to you, James. Thank you very much. Thanks, Pete. So I'm going to switch off the, the recording. Uh...